Uzbekistan. It's a fascinating country with a rich and complex history. At its peak in the Middle Ages, it was the focus of global events, but in recent centuries it's more often been peripheral and perhaps a little self-absorbed. But the signs are that the country is now ready at last to take a more active role, acting as an honest broker in the diplomatic and political developments that are shaping events around Central Asia and into Afghanistan. We've sounded opinion among national and international observers and, as Uzbekistan returns to the world stage, we'll consider the likely outcomes across the region and around the globe. Uzbekistan lies right at the heart of Central Asia, and for centuries its historic cities Bukhara and Samarkand have been legendary trading posts along the Great Silk Road. But the country has only a short history as a nation-state. It's one of the five stands created as administrative regions by the Soviet Union's officials in the early 1920s. There are numerous enclaves of one country or another, and all sorts of complications arise from that around the movements of people between the enclaves and other parts of their own countries. These borders were not drawn back in the 1920s with the intent that they ever be the borders of nation states. And so when they became the borders of nation states, that threw up an, an awful lot of problems. This is a complex neighborhood. And when they got their independence after the collapse of the USSR, every country first objective was to preserve sovereignty. Everyone really went his own way, and the leaders went their own ways. They, they weren't in close contact and collaborating. And now they're getting more mature, if you will, as states. They're more confident and they're reaching out to each other. And Uzbekistan took the lead in this. I think there's been a fairly dramatic improvement in relations under President Mirziyoyev. We really saw that very quickly after he came in uh, to power as interim president uh, in September of 2016. And let's take Tajikistan. Relations were very poor. There were minefields along the border between the two countries. In the course of this year, President Rahman has visited Uzbekistan and President Mirziyoyev of Tajikistan. They've agreed a whole raft of improvements in their relations, which are allowing people of both countries to freely move across a border that had been effectively closed to most for many years. Trade is beginning to flow. That all suggests a much greater level of underlying trust. This is the Amudarya River in the south of Uzbekistan, which marks the border with Afghanistan. To many in the West, this border represents a no-go area, but there are now stirrings of trade and development across these frontiers too. In the last year and a half to two years, Uzbekistan has been actively supporting Afghanistan in all respects. The border between Uzbekistan and Afghanistan is always open for business. You can send goods to Afghanistan and through Uzbekistan, and you can send goods to foreign countries. In addition, Uzbekistan has created favorable conditions for businessmen, and they've built a cargo center in Termez, which facilitates the work of Afghan businessmen. Of course, it's really difficult for Afghanistan now. Afghanistan lost uh, schools, many schools, and all necessary resources for education. And uh, now uh, Uzbekistan uh, tries uh, to help with the uh, creation of such resources to Afghanistan, first of all for education. We are implementing large infrastructure projects in Afghanistan, such as the construction of the Mazari Sharif Harat railways. In addition, we are building schools in Afghanistan and repairing roads and bridges. So Uzbekistan is actively involved in economic assistance to Afghanistan. And with the strengthening of security in various provinces of this country, I hope very much our economic participation our economic assistance will increase. To the Soviets, Afghanistan, the southern border of the USSR, anything beyond that was the heart of darkness. However, the Central Asians today, they're saying, wait, 
We know them. They're part of us. We, we can go there and speak our languages. We want to invest there. We want to help in its economic development, but we're also prepared to participate in the diplomacy that might solve this very, very enduring problem there. Uzbekistan offered to host and co-chair with the Afghan government a big conference in Tashkent and brought in uh, senior representatives from many countries with a stake in Afghanistan, including the United Kingdom. That conference played an important role in giving a really high-level political impulse to what's called the Kabul process, which is the Afghan-led uh, peace process that seeks to um, uh, achieve a peace dialogue within Afghanistan itself. A key part of the Kabul process has been to encourage engagement with the Taliban, a controversial policy, but one that many observers see as essential. Without dialogue with Taliban, it's really impossible to reach a peace. It's necessary, first of all, for all people living in Afghanistan, for uh, further development, for economical development, for professional development. And it's necessary for women, for uh, children. I really hope that we can establish peace in this country. I really hope that common sense will finally win out. I very much hope that those involved in the conflict will understand one thing, that it is impossible to solve your problems with a weapon. These young students are part of Afghanistan's significant minority of Uzbek speakers. They're attending a new college that has been set up in Termits in the south of Uzbekistan, just a few kilometers from the border. Over 130 young Afghans have already begun their studies here and that figure is set to rise to more than 700. We are mainly studying sciences, but we're also engaged in the arts. There are ceramics and sculpture clubs, as well as football, karate and volleyball. Our studies here don't only act as a bridge for the relationship between the two countries, they also strengthen young Afghans' hopes and our expectations for the future. When you travel to another country, you learn that country's language and culture. When we came here to Uzbekistan, we discovered Uzbek people's kindness and hospitality and the friendship between Afghans and Uzbeks. I want to become a teacher so that I can go back to Afghanistan and pass on what I've learned to the people there. Ever since we came here, our worldview has changed for the better. We were able to make a presentation on Afghanistan where we passed on the message it's not the country that everyone imagines, and our young men aren't like people think, holding weapons in their hands. They are thirsty for learning. This college is one of a number of signs pointing towards a better future for Afghanistan and its near neighbors. Just straws in the wind, perhaps? But it's also encouraging that Central Asia is starting to assert itself in the peace process. After centuries of marginalization, perhaps it's time for the region to reclaim its central role on the world stage. I firmly believe that trust between the Central Asian states has markedly increased. Without stability and security, there can be no economic and social development for the people of Central Asia. Central Asia is a bridge between Europe and Asia, and this bridge must be solid.